Well, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Pastor Allen. Good to see you, whether here in person or online. And we are a church reaching the tri-state area with a vision to be a church that the unchurched love to experience. So we don't do this just for us church folks, but try and include everyone. And our mission statement is we are following Jesus, changing together, be more like Christ. This is a holiday weekend. We've got great weather. It's the 4th of July. We celebrate the birth of our nation and the freedoms that we have. And thankfully, we get the freedom of worship. And that's one of the biggies as, as far as we're concerned. So celebrate together. We um, had a baptismal service last week. We are going to have another one. So if you missed that, we, will, uh, we can still include you. And we're still going to have a membership class that's still being scheduled. So if you'd like to become an official part of, of the congregation where you actually can be in the decision-making proce decision process, we'd love to have you a member. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, we'd love to connect with you. We have connect cards, digital connect cards. We have cards here in person. <coughs> We like, want to know what's going on in your life, questions you have, decisions you're making. Uh, we love to pray for you and pray for things that you're concerned about. We distribute those by email. We can even do that in, in the middle of the week. So anytime you can uh, submit one of those, they come, come to me, actually, and uh, appreciate hearing from you. Uh, we're going to have an offering time, and offering time is a big part of worship because we get to show God in a concrete, physical way uh, what we appreciate uh, that he's given us. I read something by uh, George Mueller this week. He said, God doesn't judge our giving by how much we give, but how much we keep. I thought that was good. So we can give by website, app, through the mail, or here in, in person. And let's pray. Father God, thank you. We thank you for uh, all our worship, and we thank you especially for... for uh, offering time where we show in a physical, concrete, financial way our thankfulness and appreciation and, and show that we have generous hearts like you, God. And that's, uh, we want to be more like you. I thank you for the generosity of this congregation. Uh, I thank you for the ministries we're able to be involved in and continue to give us wisdom and uh, making good uses of the resources. Uh, let it all be for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in a series called Emotions and... Today's topic is one I think all of us are familiar with, unfortunately, and that's anger. Before I go any further, we're going to absorb the Lord's Supper here present. Uh, for folks that are here, if you'd like to participate with us at the end of, of this service, uh, get yourself some kind of uh, bread or cracker and some kind of drink. We use grape juice here. If you've got wine, whatever you have at your uh, disposal. Okay, anger. Anger is kind of an unusual emotion in that it's not always bad, it's not always negative. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, we get angry at lots of things. We get angry at people, obviously. We get angry at concrete things. We get angry at cars or some tool or some other apparatus, the computer or the software computer usually. We get mad at, angry at that. We get angry at animals, pets. We get angry at government or government officials. We even get angry with God sometimes, don't we? So it's a really complex emotion. Now, it's something I used to deal with quite a bit, uh, the confession time, struggle with quite a bit, not so much an anymore, but one of the excuses or comebacks I would give when my wife would complain about me being angry was, I'm not angry, and I, maybe you can't relate to this, maybe you can. You have some other word you use for it. It doesn't sound so bad. And my word was, I'm just frustrated. Not angry, just frustrated. Well, what's really the difference? And we'll talk about that 
in a few minutes. So in this series, we're talking about emotions and not letting them control us. Uh, negative emotions, obviously. And so we said it this way, how to say no to the emotions that seek to control us. And anger is certainly one of those that can t take control of us. Uh, control of our mouths and our moods, right? And we'll talk about introverted and extroverted anger here in a second. So anger, these emotions can get control of our mouths and we say things we shouldn't say. We do things we wish we didn't do. We need to apologize for them. And it affects our moods. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about envy. Um, anger can be the result of envy. And we talked about guilt. Guilt can be part of anger. There's lots of ways anger feeds into our emotions. So in the series, we looked at the principle Jesus taught, and we looked at that each week. Really important to understand with emotions, because a lot of times I think we think our emotions are kind of separate from us, or we can't control them. But Jesus said, no, no, no. And we usually, especially with anger, we point to, we think are causes outside of us. So in Matthew, Jesus said this, anything you eat passes through the stomach and it goes into the sewer, no big deal. Eat the wrong thing, it passes through you. But the words you speak come from the heart. Or the next verse is going to say mind. Come from inside of us, anyway. Those are the things that defile us. Those are the things that get us in trouble with other people and put us at odds with God. He says, from the heart comes evil thoughts. So we would say from the mind comes evil thoughts. And he gives us a whole list, not all inclusive, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lying, slander, greed, wickedness, envy, pride, foolishness, etc. So evil thoughts come from our minds, and these are the pro things that cause us problems. These are the things that defile us. These are the things that put us at odds with other people and odds, at odds with God. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. Now, what we normally try and do with negative emotions is to monitor our behavior, monitor our mouths. I may have this anger on the inside, but I hold it in so uh, people don't know about it. The problem with monitoring your behavior is it's not really all that successful, is it? Especially anger. But any of these emotions, they eventually come out. So Jesus said, no, there's a better solution. There's a better way to deal with these. He says, you need to monitor your hearts or monitor your minds, monitor your thoughts. If I can uh, battle these evil thoughts, conquer these evil thoughts, then I don't have to deal with the ramifications of evil emotions. Now, if you're one of these people who said, I, I don't, I'm not an angry person, most likely you're more of an introverted angry person than an extroverted angry person. Now, I tend to be an extroverted angry person, and so people find, know pretty fast when I'm angry about something. Uh, done a lot better in recent years when I went, than when I was younger. But introverted anger is still anger. And it can have really negative effects on relationships just like extroverted anger. You ever have anybody, for example, give you the silent treatment? Can be pretty devastating, can it? That's introverted anger. They don't spill it all out, but it still has really negative effects and uh, not to mention on your, on your health. Now, all anger is not bad. Jesus got angry. Uh, the Bible says be angry and sin not. Problem is most of us can't do it. <laughs> but there is an anger. I came across a new term for me. Uh, we used to call, I used to call this righteous indignation. It's kind of a weird term, right? <laughs> it's okay to have righteous ind indignation. It just can't be angry. Well, I came across this term called crusader anger. Crusader angry. This is when your anger is directed at injustice to others. That's key. Injustice to others. Others. Most of the time we get angry because we feel injustice has been done to who? <laughs> done to us, right? So, and this has resulted in a lot of uh, positive changes in culture. For example, child labor laws. Some folks got upset the fact that kids were working and kids were getting hurt on the job and they didn't think it was right. And eventually, child labor laws got passed. How about uh, women's suffrage? You know, women used to not be able to vote. 
2,000, I mean, 240 some years ago, when it, however old our country is, um, yeah, women couldn't vote. So some people, not just women, thought that was wrong. And anger resulted in positive change. In the 60s, I lived through the 60s, and Martin Luther King Jr. and um, civil rights movement. And so some things changed in our culture. So that's crusader anger. That is about injustice to others. Um, Jesus is going to be our example. We're going to look at him in a, at, at the end. And he never got angry at what people did to him. Interesting. Even on the cross. Father, forgive them. So, we're going to look at something that Jesus' half-brother actually wrote. We have a part of our Bible called James. James was the half-brother of Jesus. Fascinating guy. Can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your older brother? Mary and Joseph saying, why can't you be like your older brother? <laughs> well, he's perfect and I'm not. I, you know. It would be fascinating. Now, best we know that James was not a Jesus follower when Jesus was teaching. Evidently, he, growing up with Jesus, he just was convinced that he wasn't that special, okay? He wasn't the Messiah. But after the resurrection, James becomes a leader in the early church. He was like one of the pastors of the church in Jerusalem. And so, maybe his teaching didn't convince him, but dying and coming back to life convinced him that he was the Son of God, the Messiah, and that he declared him as his Lord and Savior. Now, interesting side point here. James was crucified, uh, not crucified, but executed in 62 AD, so about 30 years after Jesus. We have a book of our Bible called Book of Acts that, that gives us a history of the early church, okay? James's execution is not recorded in the Book of Acts. So what's that tell you about the Book of Acts? It was written before 62 A.D. Acts was, we believe, most experts believe, was written by Luke. So Luke wrote Luke, Gospel, and the book of Acts. So consequently, it was written during the time that people were still alive that saw Jesus. And what secular colleges will try and teach you is that, oh, the, you know, that stuff was written 100 years later, and nobody was around to dispute it, and it's just a fairy tale. No, 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 no. This was history. It was written shortly after it happened, and there's no evidence that it was written later. It's just people that want to debunk uh, what's written in there. So we're going to look at this letter. James wrote a letter. And we're going to go through part of chapter 3 and chapter 4 because it wasn't written with chapters and verses. It was written as a letter. It was probably read to churches. Uh, most people couldn't read, so somebody get up and, and read it. <clears throat> He's going to teach a principle here that is critical for us to, to control emotions in general, but specifically the emotion of anger. So let's start in chapter 3, verse 13. If you are wise and understand God's ways, and most of you would be listening to me, would say, I, I hope to be wise and understand God's ways. Well, James says this, okay, then prove it. It's easy to say I'm wise and understand God's way. He says, prove it. And he's going to tell us how we can prove it. Prove it by living an honorable life. That means a life of character. A life, you know, you can be trusted, you're honest etc., etc. Um, so, an honorable life, a life of, of high quality or character. Involved also in being wise and understanding God's way is doing good works. Doing things to, to, to benefit society and other, other people with a certain attitude. So, we do these good works with humility. Not being boastful or proud, but with humility. Humble ourselves. Humility that comes from wisdom. Interesting connection, wisdom and humility. Most of us like to think we're wise. We may not be very humble. Well, James would say, if you're not very humble, you're not very wise. It's wise to be humble. 
The opposite of wisdom is what? Pride or arrogance? What really good comes from pride or arrogance when you think about it? Nothing. Now, the problem is humility is not natural, is it? So this is something you and I have to work on. <clears throat> now, when he talks about proving it, I thought about it. Fruit, fruit, trees. So, if I pick an apple, it's proof of what kind of tree is that? Somebody said in the first service, a pear tree. No. <laughs> it's evidence of proof that that is an apple tree. So, the evidence that you and I are people of honor and wise and, and um, humble is that we do good works and have strong character. Now, the next, it wouldn't be three verses in his writing, but he's going to repeat the same concept three times. So James goes on, he says, but, all right, as opposed to wise and understanding, but if you are bitterly jealous or envious, we talked about envy, and there is selfish ambition in your heart or mind, so jealousy and envy, selfish ambition, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. So don't deceive yourself, don't lie to yourself, don't lie to other people if you have an issue with envy and selfish ambition. And one of the problems we have, <clears throat> and one of the reasons we get angry is because we think life should be fair, don't we? I mean, we know it's not. We used to tell our kids all the time, life's not fair, it's not fair, parents. And you always say to your kids, well, life's not fair. <laughs> but we have this innate desire for life to be fair. And when it's not fair, it, it upsets us. We become jealous, or envious, and we become selfish. So he goes on again with the same two words. Jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. I don't think they're any kind of wisdom. <laughs> but he said, okay, being jealous, we talked about this, comparing. It's not wise to compare. Two results. Either you come off looking better than somebody else and you can be proud of that, or you come out looking worse than somebody else and you can be depressed. So he says, that's not wisdom. That's not wise. That's not smart. He says, such things are actually are earthly, unspiritual, and de even demonic. So, Jealousy and selfishness, obviously, are to be avoided. So he mentions one more time. For whatever there is envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. So when there is selfishness inside of me, there is envy inside of me, it's going to come out of me. It's going to come out of me in disorder. It's going to come out all kinds of evil. Now, we have an innate way of rationalizing, don't we? Rational, making it it's not as bad as you think it is, or everybody else is doing it. It's just the way things are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. James says, no, 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 no. You can't rationalize it away. Wisdom says you need to humble yourself and be wise. <clears throat> so he gives us the, the flip side, the positive side. He said, but wisdom from above, and he uses a list of interesting words, is first of all pure. Interesting. It's pure. It's also peace-loving. It loves peace. That's going to be in contradiction to anger when we get there. Gentle at all times. You and I be gentle all the time. Willing to yield to others, a word that our culture doesn't like very much, be, much, be submissive. I am to submit to you. I am to yield to you. I want what's best for you before what's best for me. It is full of mercy. Mercy is not giving you what you deserve. Okay? So I'm merciful. I'm forgiving and the fruit of good deeds. So again, doing good for others and our society. It shows no favoritism. 
Wow, can you imagine not showing any favoritism? And is always sincere. And then he drills down a little bit on this peacemaker thing. He says, those who are peacemakers, not peacekeepers, peacemakers, not passive, but active, will plant seeds of peace. So if you plant peace, what are you going to reap? Well, we'd say peace. He says the harvest of righteousness or right living or right things. <coughs> uh, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. So we got envy and selfish ambition as opposed to wisdom and humility. And then he brings his question. We would say chapter 4. So what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Interesting question, right? What's causing it? What's the root cause? What's the root uh, reason for quarreling and fights? Our, my natural response, and maybe your natural response, is it's not a what, it's a who, right? Think about your quarrels and fights and anger. It's usually a who, isn't it? Maybe a spouse, maybe a parent. If some of us are older, remember when we were kids, uh, just our, our, our parents aggravating us to the point of anger. Uh, we do that to our kids. Those of us, who, it could be a sibling, um, it could be a boss, it could be um, a relative, it could be a friend, it could be a co-worker, it could be your pastor. <laughs> we would say, the cause is so-and-so, that's why I'm angry. And James would say, no, that's not the cause. Now, here's what, that's is where the principle comes in. We think it's that person. He says, no, it's not. What is causing? Don't they come? He's basically saying they come from the evil desires at war. Where? Not out there. Not other people. Evil desires at war within you. You say, no, no, it's, you know, it's my car that won't start. It's my wife that won't do what I want. It's my wife who spends too much money. It's my kids that won't clean up the room. You know, no, no, no. Evil desires at war within me. We want people to see things our way, right? We want our kids to see things our way. It's important to clean your room. We want our spouse to see things our way. It's, you should spend money this way, not that money. Um, the reason we want people to see things our way is why? Because our way is right. <laughs> my, of course, my way is right. <clears throat> so, we give you a definition of anger. Uh, it's going to come from, actually from this text. When you want something, you aren't given. Think about when you get angry or frustrated. What is it? You're not, you know, the car is not starting. Um, it doesn't have to be concrete. Uh, a lot of times anger comes from like, I'm not getting the respect I deserve. You ever feel that kind of anger? Kids don't respect you, your spouse doesn't respect you, your boss doesn't respect you. Um, how about this one? Um, I earned it. I earned that promotion and I didn't get it. Or what about this one? Um, they promised. You know, at the wedding altar, my spouse promised whatever. Or my boss promised me this and he did, did deliver. My kids promised to clean up the room and they didn't. Or they promised to be home at this certain time and they weren't. Or they promised to uh, uh, not spend all their money and they did. Or again, that fairness thing. That's a big, isn't it? Well, you know, why do I have to do all this and my spouse just sits around and watches TV? Or why do I have to, you know, do this and they don't have to. Um, when we were kids, you know, why does my sibling get to do this and I can't? It's not fair. Parents, we understand this pretty well. <laughs> I was thinking about it when Josh and Mike, our two oldest boys, were young, a long time ago. <clears throat> and we had this little escort wagon 
And if you're a parent and your kids are in the back seat, what are they doing sometimes? They're picking at each other and they're quarreling and they're fighting, right? And they want something that the, they're not getting, whether it's more space or one's got a toy the other one wants, whatever it might be. <laughs> so our solution was this. It worked some of the time. <clears throat> the, back, the vinyl in that back seat had kind of an area about this wide. It was kind of uh, plain, and then the other part of the seat was, had some kind of uh, plaid or something. And so we gave that a name. That, that, that eight inches in the middle of the back seat was no boy's land, okay? And so no boy was supposed to be in there. So if Josh on this side, Mike on this side didn't get in there, they couldn't be picking at each other or stealing each other's toys or whatever. So parents, we understand this. And we have a name for God. We call him what? Our Heavenly Father. And so he, too, is dealing with our anger issues as his children. So then he gives us a definition that I just gave you. It comes from James. He says, you want what you don't have. That's why you're angry. You want what you don't have, whether it's respect or whether it's, you know, finance, something financial or whether it's, you know, freedom to do something or whatever it might be. You're angry because you don't have something you want. And what we do is we make excuses for not controlling our anger because of someone else not controlling themselves. My kids weren't obedient, so I can be angry at them and yell at them. They were out of control, so I can be angry. It's only fair, right? You can fill in the blank, whatever you want to fill it in with. <clears throat> I don't have this, so I deserve to be angry. Or I deserve to lash out. Or I deserve to give them the, the silent treatment, if that's your style of anger. <clears throat> Remember I had the illustration of uh, a couple weeks ago of the glass with the pink beads in it? Okay. So when life shakes you, when you don't get what you want, what comes out? In that case, it was, it was pink beads. <laughs> but your life and my life is, again, what Jesus said, what's inside is what comes out. And if ugliness comes out, ugliness is inside. Anger comes out, anger is inside. <clears throat> so, there's lots of techniques, I guess you would call them. Here's a technique when you become angry. Say to yourself, and maybe even say it out loud if you're with your spouse or something, you know what part of the problem is? I'm not getting what I want. Stop. Whatever you're arguing about, whatever you're angry about, whatever fights and quarreling about, Stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not, it's not all the problem. But part of the problem is I'm not getting something I want. And probably the other person's going to, if they're honest, could say the same thing. I'm not getting my way. I'm not getting to stay up later. I'm, if you're a kid, I'm not getting to spend money on my, my hobby. I'm not able to go here. Um, the list is endless, right? I know what part of the problem is. This has a way of bringing the, the heat down, bringing, diffusing the situation. And it's a way of saying, anger, you're not going to control me. Now, it's hard to do. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this is anything easy. It's hard to do because anger is such a volatile emotion, isn't it? But according to James and Jesus, <laughs> this is something we can and must control. Uh, there's a relatively new term called EQ. You know what that is? You know what IQ is, right? How smart you are. Well, EQ is how um, emotionally developed you are, or emotionally mature you are. And so you and I need to develop our EQ. 
and become emotionally mature enough to deal constructively with these emotions. So let me ask you a question. What is your relationship with anger? Is it in control of you or are you in control of it? And if you're married, you know who can tell you the answer to the question? Your spouse. <laughs> your spouse would be the best person to tell you your relationship with your anger. <clears throat> so, if it's not perfect, humble yourself. Wise people, humble themselves. Humble yourself. Yeah, it's an issue I got to work on. It's me. It's me. And as we've been saying in this series, if you're a Jesus follower, and if you're not, this, there's some much that can benefit from this. And we're glad you're watching or he here. But if you're a Jesus follower, you already have a boss. You already have someone over you, controlling you. So I got to thinking about Jesus' relationship to all of this. So I want to end with a couple of verses from something Paul wrote in the book of Philippians. He put it this way. <clears throat> Though he, meaning Jesus, was God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Okay, if you're God, what can you do? What can you get? Anything and everything, right? You're God. So Jesus, being God, didn't use this godliness to his own advantage. Advantage, and we're going to see how extreme he takes that. Instead, what do you do instead? He gave up his divine privilege. Now, we cannot comprehend how you can be an almighty God in heaven and limit yourself to time and space and a body. But that's what Jesus did. He describes it this way. He took the humble position of a what? Of a slave or a servant. He was born as a human being. That's what he had to do to be born as a human being. Now, let me ask you a simple question. How many rights does a slave have? <clears throat> Only one I could think of it has the right to obey his master. That's, that's the only right they have. So how far is Jesus willing to go? How far was he willing to humble himself? And the text tells us. When he appeared in human form... He humbled himself in obedience to God. How far? And died a criminal's death on the cross. Not just to die, not just die a criminal's death, but to die a criminal's death on the cross. Bottom line is this. It's okay not to get all you want. Did Jesus want to die on the cross? No. It's okay not to get everything you want. I'm backing up to the leading verse of this text. Paul said it this way, in your relationship with one another, in your relationships, have the same mindset or attitude as Christ Jesus. That's your choice and my choice. So here's your quote-unquote assignment. Who or what is your anger trigger? Really helpful to identify that. Is it something about your spouse? Is it something about your boss? Is it something about yourself? Identify it. And then will you take the first step of humility? I guess the first step is identifying it. In a relationship, the more mature, mature, mature excuse me, mature person We'll take the first step. So as I end, I want to talk to men. Men? I don't know what it is, but we seem to have more issues here than the women do. We seem to have more trouble humbling ourselves. We have more pride issue. So I want to challenge you to be the more mature. Have the higher EQ. Be the first to humble ourselves and say, hey, I know part of the problem here is I'm not getting what I want. I challenge you to do that. Let me pray with you, and then we'll observe the Lord's Supper together. Father God, thank you. We thank you for the wisdom of your word. We thank you for the example of Jesus. Uh, we pray that we would be humble, that we would be wise, 
that we would be people that would take this issue seriously, that we would deal with the inside, which would take care of what comes out on the outside. Uh, as Jesus followers, we already have a boss. We are to be obedient to. Um, if you're not a Jesus follower, we pray that you would consider, seriously consider taking that step, accepting the gift that Jesus humbly sacrificed himself for so that you can be in right relationship with God, <clears throat> confess your sins and accept that gift and enter into a relationship. Uh, if we can help you with that, please let us know. God, we thank you for this observance, the Lord's Supper that we'll share together. It's a reminder of how you humbled yourself. It should be an encouragement for us to do so also. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Jesus, uh, the last night of his life here on earth, humbled himself to the place. I don't know if I can read this without my glasses. We'll see. He uh, observed the biggest holiday for in Judaism, the Passover, celebrating, well, you know, in Moses and the Israelites. Yeah, I might need this. Uh, Moses and the Israelites went, got out of Egypt. And um, last night of his life, that's what he celebrated. But the amazing thing was he changed it. He said, okay, for a thousand years, we've been celebrating it this way. Now it's going to mean something different something better. So if you have your elements, please ask that you would join with me. I read uh, Paul's recounting of Jesus' words. <clears throat> Did everybody get it? Oh, Tim still distributes. Okay. So um, Jesus took this, again, most important celebration of Judaism, and he's going to change it. Um, it's kind of hard for us to comprehend, isn't it? It's kind of like, um, I'm trying to think of some, 4th of July. We're going to change the 4th of July. It's not going to be the celebration of the, the uh, beginning of the United States of America. We would all kind of push back against that, wouldn't you? So it's amazing the disciples um, didn't. So if you have your elements... As I read, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and said, Okay, this represented that, you know, the manna in the wilderness. Now it's going to represent something else. Or that last meal they had before they left Egypt. This is my body, represents my body which in this case was going to be, but it has now been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to, we can't comprehend again, willing to leave the glories of heaven, come here to earth and deal with sin and sinful mankind and then be willing to give the ultimate sacrifice to give your body so we might have a relationship with you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Not only did he give his body, he shed his blood. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. See, Jesus had to shed blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to do what we could not do. We being sinful could not die for sin. We thank you that you were willing not just die, but shed your blood. The ultimate sacrifice so we might have life. Life now and for eternity. 
in relationship with you, our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. And then Paul writes this, wherever you eat this bread and drink this cup as we have just done, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. <clears throat> let me pray with you and let you go. Father God, we thank you that you, Jesus, were the ultimate example of love, sacrificial love. And God, those of us that are Jesus' followers live in your shadow. We live with your example. And we should be examples of sacrificial love also, of grace and mercy. Uh, first century church turned the world upside down with that basic principle. God, we pray that we too might turn the world upside down as your obedient servants, but also children. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us.